أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه الغر المايمين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We begin as we always do by first and foremost praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking him, acknowledging that he is the only one worthy and deserving of all praise and thanks. And we ask him to shower his most complete and abundant blessings and protection upon his noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his noble family, upon his shining companions, and upon all of those that follow them until the end of time. And we ask Allah to include us from amongst them. We ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us, to benefit us through what he has taught us, and to increase us in knowledge and accepted actions. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah everyone. Welcome to IOK's Beautifying Character series. Today we will be getting a new character pair, the praiseworthy of which is Silatur Rahim, maintaining and connecting family ties. Linguistically, the title of this quality is composed of two words, so let's go ahead and look at each one of those words individually and then put them together for a cohesive technical understanding. Linguistically, the term sila is one of two verbal nouns from the verb wasala yaslilu, the other verbal noun being wasl. This term is derived from the root letters waw, sad, and lam, which indicate toward a meaning of joining one thing to another until they are fully attached fully tied and stuck together. This is the linguistic opposite of abandonment, disassociation, separation. Now looking at the term rahim, linguistically rahim is a noun which means the womb of a mother, the womb of a woman. It is derived from the root letters ra, ha, and mim, and these root letters indicate towards a meaning of softness, affection, compassion. Technically, sila means al-'atfu wa rahma affection and grace, and rahim means amun fi kulli rahimin min the wil arham, a general term to refer to every blood-related family member. Putting those two terms together, sila to rahim technically means al-ihsanu ila al-aqaribi ala hasab hal al-wasil wal mausul goodness and excellence towards relatives in accordance with the state of the connector and the family member being connected. Sometimes it, meaning that excellence and goodness, will be through wealth. Sometimes it will be through service. Sometimes it will be through visiting, sometimes it will be through greeting, and the list goes on. This definition explains that Silat al-Rahim in a nutshell is any form of goodness and excellence that a person may do towards their relatives. And whatever form that goodness and excellence is depends on the relationship between the two parties. The two parties are both connected by blood, yes, but there is going to be an obvious difference between the connection you maintain with your siblings and the connection you maintain with your cousins. There is going to be a difference in the connection you maintain with your aunt who lives down the street and your aunt who lives in a different country and you have only seen once or twice in your life. At the end of the day, every single blood-related member of the family has rights over you. But how you fulfill those rights is going to depend on the relationship, and that is totally okay. Similarly, that goodness and excellence is going to depend not only on the relationship, but also on the needs of the various relatives. Some relatives may be struggling financially. And so the appropriate goodness to them will be financial assistance, dropping off food every now and then, offering to help with certain expenses. Some relatives, on the other hand, may be lonely. Spouse passed away, children are all grown up, 
And so the appropriate goodness to them will be visiting, frequent phone calls, regular contact. And yet again, some other relatives may just be busy. And so the appropriate goodness to them will be taking some of that busyness off of their plate, offering to watch the kids sometimes, running their errands while you run your own. And the list goes on. Every single relative is going to have different needs that will necessitate a different type of goodness and excellence from you that they are deserving of. And every single relative is going to have a different relationship, a different degree of relationship with you in terms of what type of excellence and goodness is appropriate for them. So Silatul Rahim is not always a one-size-fits-all type of deal. You have to look at the degree of relationship, and you also have to look at the needs of the various relatives involved. There is a slight difference of opinion among the scholars in regards to who exactly is included as part of a person's Rahim. The category of Rahim that is obligatory to maintain ties with, who does this include? Who does that entail? On one end of the spectrum of opinions, the Rahim is a very narrow and small category of people. The Rahim that is obligatory to maintain ties with includes only the Maharim and their gendered counterparts, meaning parents, grandparents and above, children, grandchildren and below, parents, siblings, grandparent siblings and above, siblings, siblings' children, siblings' grandchildren and below, etc. The lens that this categorization, that this opinion uses, is the lens of marriage. The Rahim only includes the people that a person cannot marry, as well as their gendered counterparts. And when I say gendered counterparts, what I mean is, if you are a woman, you cannot marry your nephew. So your ne nephew is part of your Rahim. You cannot marry your niece anyways because you are a girl. And so the niece is the gendered counterpart of the nephew. Meaning the niece and nephew are at the same level of inclusion when it comes to Silatul Rahim. This categorization, this opinion, is the most narrow. It includes the fewest number of people only the maharim and their gendered counterparts. This categorization does not include cousins. It does not include your parents' cousins. So this is one opinion and it is among the weaker of the opinions that we will be covering. Another opinion, instead of using marriage as the lens, this next opinion uses inheritance as the lens. Everybody that is technically able to inherit, even if they do not actually inherit. This includes everyone with any amount of shared blood, all the way up until the very last resort, the furthest individual of kindred whom, if there was absolutely no one else left related to the decedent at a closer degree, he or she would take the inheritance before it escheats to the state. So this categorization is much broader. It includes way more people, and this is a very widely accepted opinion. The Rahim, the Rahim of which a person must maintain ties with, includes every relative of shared blood. Any relative to whom the womb, the Rahim from which they came, connects at some point up the family tree. Now, there are just a few ancillary issues that are connected to the question of who exactly is included in a person's rahim, the rahim of which maintaining ties is obligated. Number one, are in-laws included within a person's rahim? This is an opinion. Some scholars opine that yes, a person's in-laws are included in that group of relatives with whom maintaining a family tie is obligatory. They may not be connected by blood, but they do have a special set of rights upon you that any other average Muslim may not necessarily have. There are at least two rational proofs that establish this. Rational meaning the proof, the evidence does not come from the Qur'an or the Sunnah per se, but is a rational, logical, conceptual proof. 
One, when we look at family ties through the lens of marriage, meaning people that you cannot marry, those are exactly your closest relatives, there is an element of that established with an individual's in-laws. When a woman gets married, her father-in-law becomes her mahram. When a man gets married, his mother-in-law becomes his mahram. So between the in-laws at the level of parents, there is the establishment of a new relationship that resembles that of one's actual parents in a legal sense. Number two, when a married couple has a child, that child automatically becomes the mahram of the parents and the mahram of both sets of grandparents. Meaning if I have a daughter, that daughter becomes the mahram of my husband and my father and my father-in-law. So through her, I am connected to my father-in-law and the other members of my husband's immediate family, his brothers and his sisters. So if you think about it in terms of the transitive property, I think it's called, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. For those of you that are more uh, mathematically and formula inclined. If she, the daughter, is my rahim and she is my father-in-law's rahim, then one can logically conclude that my father-in-law is included in my rahim as well. So this is the first ancillary issue of are a person's in-laws included in their technical rahim, the relatives with whom maintaining a family tie is obligatory? Number two, the second ancillary issue is whether a person's spouse is included in his or her rahim. Does the spouse count as a relative or is the spouse a whole separate category? It's a little bit of both. The spouse is a whole separate category, but when Zainab radiallahu anha, the wife of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if she could give charity to her husband, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, na'am, laha ajran, ajru al-qarabati wa ajru al-sadaqa. Yes, she can give charity to her husband. And she will receive two rewards, one for maintaining closeness or helping relatives, and one for the charity. There is some difference of opinion on how, quite how to interpret this hadith, but there is some evidence here that the relationship between husband and wife is subject to similar notions of maintaining the tie, keeping it strong and connected, just as one would do for their blood relatives. Number three, the third ancillary issue is whether a person's milk siblings are included in his or her rahim. Milk siblings are those individuals who were breastfed by the same woman, not necessarily born of the same woman. They may have different biological mothers, but they breastfed from the same woman. Now, this obviously does not happen too much in our society anymore to hire a wet nurse and do all of that, but it's still worth looking at for those individuals who do decide to engage in this practice. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whatever becomes impermissible through blood ties or lineage also becomes impermissible through breastfeeding. Meaning when a person is blood related to another individual, making that person impermissible to marry, that same link, that same connection will be made when a person breastfeeds from the same person from the same woman. Just like a man cannot marry his biological sister, he also cannot marry his milk sister, even if she has no blood relation with him at all. So this hadith, again, establishes that milk siblings do have a certain heightened relationship among each other that makes them a different, special, and unique relationship in comparison with others. So I very much apologize that this section was very fiqh intensive and fiqh heavy. That was not my intention at all, and that is not the intention of this video. Rather, this section is simply to help answer the question, who is included in my rahim? 
Who are those individuals with whom I am obligated to maintain family ties with? In a nutshell, the safest opinion is that a person's rahim includes all of his or her blood relatives, anyone that is related to that person by blood. And if a person wants to be even safer and strive even harder for even more reward, then if the person has these relationships, then also include the in-laws, the spouse, and the milk siblings as well. And at the end of the day, it is not like being good to people, giving others your goodness and excellence is a bad thing. There is nothing wrong with casting the rahim net as wide as possible and including as many people as you possibly can. So if possible, try to make your rahim, who you include, as big as possible. Include as many people as you can. Give as many people who have any sort of larger family connection to you, your goodness, your excellence, and your grace. That will, without a doubt, be good for you. It cannot be a bad thing to maintain ties with your in-laws, to maintain ties with your extended cousins, to maintain ties with your milk siblings. It will be a good thing. So if possible, cast the net as wide as possible and it will be good for you and your relationships at large. Now, some people at this point might be thinking, man, I have to maintain ties with all of these people? That is insane. I don't even know all of the people I have blood relations with. I barely have time to take care of myself. Remember that the level of maintenance that you give each family tie will differ depending on the degree of relationship. For some people, it will require a lot more work, like taking care of your parents regularly, visiting your siblings frequently. The degree of relationship is much higher, and so the work and effort it will require from you is going to be much higher. But on the flip side, for some people, for some relatives, it will maintaining the family tie will require a lot less work, like calling your aunts and uncles on Eid, meeting with your cousins whenever you visit their part of the country or their part of the world, showing them a good time whenever they visit you. All of our blood relatives have rights over us, but how we fulfill those rights will differ based on context and circumstance. Cousins are not at the same level as parents. Aunts and uncles are not at the same level as siblings. And so the degree of relationship is going to have an impact. How often, how capable you are of fulfilling those rights is going to have an impact in terms of physical distance and whatnot. All of our blood relatives have a right. That is musallam, that is true and established. But how we fulfill those rights, what we do to maintain those ties, that's going to depend on context and circumstance. So do not feel overwhelmed, do your best. So we discussed at length who are included within a person's rahim. Now, what is the ruling of maintaining ties with those people? What is the hukum? What is the ruling of silat rahim There is a difference of opinion, obviously, on who that rahim includes. But when it comes to the ruling itself, there is not a single legitimate dissenter in the entire scholarly tradition that Silat al-Rahim is mandatory. There is no difference of opinion on that. There's a difference of opinion on who the Rahim is, but the ruling of Silat al-Rahim, everyone says that it is mandatory. It is wajib. It is an obligation. Cutting off family ties is an agreed upon major sin. Family ties is family ties are a, a serious affair in this religion and must not be taken lightly. But at the same time, like we have been discussing over and over, there are levels. The, obligation of, the obligations of this religion are not designed to overwhelm us. No one is expected to quit their lives and dedicate every moment to making sure that they are calling their uncle and bringing dinner to their aunt and buying toys for their nieces and nephews and visiting their cousins and bringing them gifts. 
If a person has time to do all that, that is wonderful and that is great and a person will get reward for that. But Allah is not going to obligate us to do anything above what we are physically capable of doing. This video is not intended to overwhelm anyone. I know, especially a lot of us in the immigrant community, we have a lot of relatives, a lot of them, and they're all around the world and we don't even know a lot of them. We don't even know who they are. There's so many that we haven't even met before. Do not be overwhelmed. Do not think that you are falling into sin because you haven't talked to your extended cousin in back home because they don't have a phone in that village and you've never gone to visit them. You know, that, that's nothing to, to cause paranoia in one's heart that, man, I haven't talked to that person. I don't know what I'm doing to maintain ties with that person. Maintaining family ties is a serious matter, yes, and we have to give it importance and priority in our daily lives. But how we do it can change and adjust to suit various circumstances. What is the bare minimum? What is the absolute lowest level of maintaining a family tie that each and every single one of us must engage in in order to stay away from the major sin of cutting off family ties? Adnaha tarqul muhajarati bil kalami walaw bis salam. The absolute lowest level of sila, the bare minimum that we must all do regardless of circumstance, is not forsake or abandon speaking with them, even if it is just saying salam. We cannot refuse to talk to any blood relative. We cannot say, I'm not going to talk to so-and-so anymore. I'm not going to say salam to so-and-so anymore whenever I see them. SubhanAllah, the bare minimum is an extremely low bar. The least we have to do is refrain from refusing to talk to them. This doesn't mean call them every single day. This means that you cannot say, no, I do not want to talk to that person. If a person at the very least is willing to talk to their blood relatives, is willing to say salam, to have a conversation, to be cordial, then this person will not count as someone who has broken off a family tie. So with that cousin that you may have never met before and they live in a different part of the world and you've never seen them and you've never talked to them, as long as a situation comes up in which they give you a phone call and you are willing to talk to them, that counts as maintaining that family tie. If that person calls you and you say, no, I don't want to talk to them, that will be a cut. That will be a cut in that family tie. So even if you do not go out there and initiate you have to at least not cut off the family tie. At least be willing to talk and have a conversation. If a person at the very least is willing to talk, then they will not count as someone who has broken off a family tie. And if a person does some acts of goodness, but they do not go above and beyond, you know, you do some good things nice, nice here and there, but you do not go above and beyond, that's, that's okay that person will not be labeled as someone who has cut off a family tie. It is good to go above and beyond and it is recommended and we should give our family members and our blood relatives the highest level of priority when it comes to us giving goodness and us giving excellence and grace to others. But the bare minimum, you don't need to go above and beyond to maintain those family ties. At the same time, if a person neglects to do the bare minimum, even though he or she has full capacity to do so, then that person, unfortunately, cannot be labeled as someone who has maintained a family tie. For anyone that is related to us by blood, for anyone that is related to us by blood, it is mandatory to maintain a tie between us and them. The way we maintain that tie will be different according to the relationship, some family members will have more rights than others. Generally, the closer the connection is, the more rights exist in maintaining that relationship. And the way we maintain that tie will be different according to the needs of the various relatives. Some family members will need a lot more of our time and effort, and some family members will need less. And we didn't touch upon this, or we slightly touched upon this earlier, but just like all other obligations, 
how much we how we maintain that tie will also depend on what is within our own personal capabilities. Some of us can afford to offer financial help and that is good, but some of us cannot offer financial help. A person will be obligated to maintain family ties in accordance with his or her own capabilities. At the bare minimum, however, and this applies across the board, we cannot cut off family members by refusing to talk to them. That is the absolute lowest rung that we all have to safeguard and protect ourselves from at all costs. And we will talk next week, inshallah, about extremely common reasons today that we see all the time as to why people cut off family ties. Argument, disagreement, some sort of refusal to forgive. We will talk about all of those different reasons and how we cannot let those reasons get between us and fulfilling an obligation of Allah. To close, let us look at some verses of the Quran and narrations of the Prophet ﷺ regarding Salatul Rahim. In Surah An-Nisa, verse number one, a verse that we hear all the time in Jumu'ah Khutbah, at weddings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina, uh, Ya ayyuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisa'a wa attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba Mankind, be conscious of your Lord, the one who created you all from a single soul and then created from that soul its partner and spread through those two individuals many men and women. Be conscious of Allah, the one by whom you seek your mutual rights and be conscious of family ties. Surely Allah is all watchful over you. In the latter part of the verse, Allah says, be conscious of me and be conscious of your family ties. The word taqwa is used only once, but it is used to refer to both Allah and family ties. And when we see Allah choosing to mention something in such close proximity and relation to him, we know for sure that that is something extremely weighty, heavy and important. Be conscious of family ties. This is a direct command from Allah. And we often translate taqwa as being conscious, being mindful, but in reality, it is a very complex word. Taqwa linguistically comes from wiqaya, which is a shield. And so taqwa in a technical sense is when, when used with family ties, it means to put a shield between yourself and between cutting family ties. Make it so that you are on one side of a barrier and on the other side of the barrier is cutting off family ties. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't reach it. It is not an option for you. There is a barrier between it and you. You are not even gonna think about it. That is the level of separation, wiqaya, we should have between us and even thinking of cutting off a family tie. In Surah Ar-Rum, verse number 38, Allah says, فَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَبْنَ السَّبِيلِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Give the relatives their due right, as well as the poor and the traveler. That is best for those who desire the pleasure of Allah. Those are the successful ones. Here we have another obligation, a command to fulfill the rights that our relatives have upon us. Obeying that command and fulfilling those rights is what is best for those who desire Allah's pleasure. And that's all of us, frankly. We all desire Allah's pleasure. And that, fulfilling the rights of our family members and earning the pleasure of Allah through that action will make us among the successful ones. May Allah make us from them. Ameen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna rahima shajna, inna rahima shajna tun min ar-Rahman. Faqal Allahu man wasala ki wasaltuhu wa man qata'a ki qata'atuhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The rahim is a connected branch to ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Allah said to the rahim, 
Whoever maintains you, I will maintain him or her. And whoever cuts you off, I will cut off him or her. Powerful hadith. And there are a number of ahadith that are very similar to this one. So many of them. The Prophet ﷺ is saying that the word rahim, the word rahim, that term, is derived from Allah's divine name and attribute ar-Rahman. They have the same exact root letters. The word rahim, which we use to mean family ties, is derived from among the greatest names of Allah. And that in and of itself just goes to show how important family ties are. The word that we use for family ties, rahim, is derived from Allah's, among Allah's greatest names. Allah then talks to the rahim. And there are a number of interpretations as to what this means. Is it a metaphorical womb? Is it the concept of family ties itself? But regardless, Allah addresses the rahim and tells it, I will maintain whoever maintains you. Meaning whoever safeguards, protects, maintains, and connects his or her family ties, Allah will safeguard, protect, maintain, and connect with him or her. And on the flip side, Allah says, I will cut off whoever cuts you off. Meaning whoever neglects to maintain family ties, whoever cuts ties, abandons family members, forsakes relatives. Allah will cut, abandon, and forsake that individual. May Allah protect us. And like I said, there are many ahadith like this, where Allah is addressing the rahim, or the rahim itself is speaking. And the concept is overall the same. Allah will connect with, maintain, and safeguard those who connect, maintain, and safeguard their family ties. And Allah will abandon, forsake and reject those who abandon, forsake and reject family ties. The Prophet ﷺ also said, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ بِالْمُكَافِئِ وَلَكِنِ الْوَاصِلُ الَّذِي إِذَا قَطَعَتْ رَحِمُهُ وَصَلَهَا The true connector of family ties is not necessarily the one who equally compensates for good. Rather, the true connector of family ties is the one whom, when a family tie is broken, he or she connects it. Here we are taught an important lesson on what it means to connect a family tie. I know throughout this video we have been using the word maintenance, which implies that the thing is functioning in the first place. But here we learn that even if the thing is broken, even if the family tie is broken, there's nothing to maintain, someone has to go in there and fix it. When a relative is good to you, it is easy to be good to them back. And we should equally compensate for the good that they have given us. That is a praiseworthy thing. But what can be even more praiseworthy, because it is more difficult, is connecting and fixing a family tie after it has been broken. Making amends, reconciling, forgiving, fixing things, making things right again. By fixing and connecting a broken family tie, this is the mark, this is the true mark of a person who gives high importance and much weight to Slidat rahim May Allah help all of us to maintain our current family ties, to fix and connect any broken family ties, and he may, may He make our strong, positive, and connected relationships with our family members a means of Him connecting with, safeguarding, and protecting us. Ameen. I apologize for the long video, but inshallah next week we'll continue with the opposite. وصلى الله مع على خير خلقك محمد والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله.